Cool. Well, Thomas, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the Narratives Podcast, Will. Absolutely. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, do you mind giving us just kind of a brief bio and some of the big ideas you're interested in? Yeah, so maybe I can just start with a quick introduction of myself. So I am one of the two co-founders of the Data Economy Index, and that is a decentralized index capturing the growth of data-centric Web3 protocols. That's what we are calling the data economy. And really, I guess the two things that I'm super passionate, super interested in, um, are what I perceive as the two technological mega trends of the next decade, which is artificial intelligence and blockchain. And the data economy sits right in between those two things. I love that. And, and can you talk about what the data economy is? You know, I like I, I I've always been really interested in finance. Um, uh, crypto has been interesting to me. Bitcoin, in particular, um, been you know really following it for quite a few years. Um, but you know, you know, it, it's kind of like the Web three thing. You know, it's just this big term that's popped up there. But but the data economy index. You know, what is it? Yeah, I mean, maybe I would even take a step back before describing what the data economy is, but. You know, so I actually got into crypto through my interest in artificial intelligence. So, so I discovered crypto through, um, basically, I worked at Amazon for a few years in finance on the Kindle content and Prime teams. And when I was there, I just got really sucked into machine learning and artificial intelligence on this website called Kaggle. Now, if you ever, oh, yeah. have you ever heard Absolutely. of, have you ever heard of Kaggle? Yeah, yeah, they have these so, competitions. Yeah, so it's basically these crowdsourced data science competitions. And I think one of the coolest examples I saw was um, this person ended up becoming the chief data scientist of Kaggle, but they were able to predict um, basically from, from scans or x-rays if somebody had lung cancer better than a, a team of board certified radiologists. And I saw that and I was like, holy shit, that is a big deal. Yeah, this is um, important. I got to learn about this. So I actually left my job at Amazon and taught myself data science by competing in these competitions and then doing some courses on Udacity and Coursera. And then kind of while I'm doing that, I found Numeri, which is similar to Kaggle, but it's for predicting the stock market. And when I was doing that, they were paying me in Bitcoin. And I was like, I, you know, I'd heard of Bitcoin and stuff, but it's not yeah. really... You know, I'm just like, oh, why do I have to get a Coinbase account and sell my Bitcoin to get dollars? This is really kind of obnoxious and annoying. And then I ended up getting a, a job as a data scientist in North Carolina and basically totally forgot about it for six months. And, you know, then you've got the big ICO boom in 2017. All my friends, a few of my friends who are data scientists were like, you got to get into Ethereum. And then come to find out I'd been included in the Numeri airdrop and had all of these tokens and I had no idea what was going on, but you know, yeah. there's nothing like somebody just throwing a bunch of money at you and not <laughs> understanding why to get you really interested like, in that. Hmm, I need to pay attention to this. Yeah. So as a, I'm, this is, I promise this will this yeah. tie up here because you asked what the data economy is, but that basically got me hooked into crypto and I was already hooked into AI. And so I started investing in crypto very heavily while working as a data science manager at a fintech startup in North Carolina for the past four years. And it was mostly Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then some of these, what I would call like data centric uh, blockchain projects. So Numerair yeah. was one of them, basic attention token. Both of these are in the data economy index, by the way, was another Augur, uh, which is like a prediction market was another one that I got really interested in and invested in. And basically since 2020, there's just so much in crypto now that it is really hard for one person to just find like good things to invest in. Right. And so I, I realized that basically there's now multiple sectors in crypto and the number of sectors is increasing and there's going to be more. And as like an individual, you can't just be like, oh, I'm just going to buy Bitcoin or Ethereum and that's it. So um, basically at the end of 2020, I'm looking for a 
kind of my next adventure that I right. want to do. And I found this thing called the Index Cooperative, which is an Ethereum, basically uses Ethereum-based architecture to build passive indexes of different crypto sectors. Very cool. And so the first one is the DeFi Pulse Index, which tracks DeFi, which I think a lot is on a lot of people's radar now as a crypto sector. And I'm looking at that and I see that Augur is in there. And I'm like, hmm, Augur is definitely this kind of like AI, not really AI, but data-based protocol. But then I'm like, why are why does it not have these other things in it yeah. that I know have a purpose for existing and are interesting and, and worthy of investment? And so that got me basically thinking that there was room for me to build an index, a passive index that that tracked these projects that I'd been following for years, but didn't have an index yet. Right. And so the and then I, I was doing some more research and I basically discovered that there were a lot of other tokens that kind of fit into this general idea that didn't have a place. Got it. And and that's the kind of the beginning of me working on the data economy index, but there's a, there's a whole lot more there, but I've been talking a lot, so. No, yeah, this is great. And, and so like, you know, how many different assets do you hold within the data economy index? Right now it's just seven. Just seven. Um, which there but there's a lot more that should be in there that we want to add and for basically technological feasibility reasons we can't yet but we're okay. constantly evaluating and look you know following the state of the art technologies in the crypto web3 block you know whatever buzzword you want to use right. ecosystem to figure out how we can add in these other assets that do belong in it gotcha super interesting so, I, I, that's that's really interesting um I, I'm curious, you know, like this, this may be related. It may not be quite related. Uh, you know, I see a lot of DeFi projects and, you know, I see, you know, really high yield, right? Like really high yield, like, you know, really high APY. And I'm like, like there can't be a free lunch, right? Like, like why, why, why are the yields so high? Does that make sense? Um, and and is, oh, yeah. is, is that a good intuition to have generally? Or like, like, I think it is a good intuition to have. And it's one that when I was, first investing in DeFi and yeah. starting to kind of build in it, become yeah. an, entre a, an, an entrepreneur within DeFi, DeFi, that is a question that like really bothered me right. is as I was around a lot of people and, you know, um, you know, and there's all these like memes. So people will call themselves like ape or apes or degens, which basically just means like, don't even think about whatever the merits of a project are just immediately throw some money in it and then hope it, <laughs> it skyrockets, which is not at all the way that I invest or right, think right, about right, right, right. or think about things. So I'm kind of like, Hmm, a thousand percent interest rate. What's the catch? Right. Right. So yeah, I think that's absolutely a good, a good instinct to have, but that being said there, I mean, there's a lot of different, it's kind of like, what does high yield mean to you? Right. <laughs> what, like when you say high high yield, what does what does that mean? I think uh, you know, like uh, thirty percent, like seemed like high. You know, that, that seemed like really like I, I just think of like uh, so you know what stocks return ten percent a year. Um, you know, like on average, going back in time, you know, real like estate, like hundred years or something. Yeah, yeah hundred yeah. hundred years. Maybe it's like a lot. You know, ten and a half for real estate. Maybe bonds are like five percent. You know, so like this is like man, this is like three x the average for you know stock returns. Like that's high, right? Like. Um, which doesn't mean there's not a twenty dollar bill on the sidewalk. Like it could be there, but it's just like, man, like why aren't more people picking it up and driving that down? Right. And I think what's really kind of an interesting thing that I've observed is, you know, there's there's this funny meme that's going around with this. Uh, was it the distribution meme? And it's kind of like the people on the most extreme ends yes. of the distribution <laughs> yes. have the same opinion. So it's basically like the stupidest people and the smartest people are yes, doing the yes, same the yes. same thing. Yeah, the bell curve meme. And I think it's really accurate with crypto or or it is in a lot of different ways because the reality is that crypto does have real yields that I, I believe adjusted for risk are way higher. Like are, than are any. much higher than anything else. Yeah. And so using your like $20 bill analogy, um, 
you know, the way I think of it is, is, you know, Bitcoin is still, you know, like a hundred dollar bill that's on the sidewalk that people yeah. don't, don't pick up. You know, it's kind of like, I almost imagine it as, you know, Bitcoin is, is, is this money that's just sitting on the sidewalk and, you know, basically for years, economists keep walking by it. And one of them points at it and goes, that's not a real hundred dollar bill, because if it were somebody else would have already picked it up and then right. all of, so all, no of ends up picking it up. all of them are just virtue signaling with each other. Yeah. So, so yeah. none of them actually pick it up, but it actually is valuable and a real thing. And really Bitcoin is just the tip of the, the iceberg of all of this. Gotcha. Is it something where like, you know, um, I'm talking to Mark Yusko, Yusko soon. He used to manage um, UNC's endowment, and now he has a really big hedge fund, crypto hedge fund called Morgan Creek D Digital. And he was really mm -hmm. early to the Bitcoin space, especially for a professional money manager. And I have this feeling that, you know, if you are a professional money manager, there's a lot of pressure not to do something that would be considered like, you know, uh, you know, outside the norm or something like that. And so you would probably avoid buying Bitcoin. It, you know, is that, is that a, a way you could theorize like why it's still underpriced? If that makes sense that you would buy is that professional money managers don't want to look stupid. So they just like, won't touch it. So there's a lot of yeah, institutional think, capital avoiding it. Yeah. I think that's a huge element. I think though, Bitcoin is definitely becoming mainstream. Yes, um, right. Even so though, it's still, it, like in my view, Bitcoin at a trillion dollar market cap is still orders of magnitude lower than where it's going to be in five or ten years. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's like some pretty good research on this. I've seen shared by um, I think Chamath actually like shared an article or a researcher paper. I think Warren Buffett has said the same thing that yeah, um, when you're investing with somebody else's money, you are inherently less risk averse and more doing what your peers are doing, you know, because, you know, that's like your, when you're investing with somebody else's money, it's probably a, your job. So right. if the people you're investing on their behalf think that you're doing something crazy or risky, then, that then you're going to lose more. your job. Whereas, you know, me with like my personal money, you know, I'm like, you know, the most I can lose is everything. Right. So, um, you know, I can make as an individual, you know, more risky bets for myself than maybe I would if I were doing it for other people. Right. Got it. And and risky. Maybe, and I that's the thing is I don't consider Bitcoin even a risky bet at this point. Right. Um so like I, you know, I don't even hold at this point, I don't even hold dollars except to pay for living expenses. To me, like Bitcoin is 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 the savings vehicle. And the other things are actually the investment vehicles. And you're always gotcha. trying to out-return Bitcoin. <laughs> That's super cool. And and what is it? So uh, if you don't mind asking, and if you don't mind me asking, in, in like percentage terms, you know, what does your portfolio kind of look like? Uh, it's over 70% crypto. Gotcha. Oh, wow. That's a lot. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, it's like, if you've ever heard of it, you know, it's basically a thing where, so I think it was in 2019. So I used to invest only in index funds. So I've had this kind of strange arc, right. actually, where I only used to invest in index fund index funds because I I bought this kind of logic that is pushed by the money management industry that it's not possible to beat, you know, an index fund, right? And right. you know, efficient markets hypothesis, um, yeah. you know, and if you're beating it, you're just lucky or whatever. And I'd, I'd bought into that for a long time. And basically around, it must've been 2018, 2019, I just no longer believed this to be true. And I, and I thought that individuals can beat the market. And so what I did is I invested over two thirds of my portfolio only in things that I had deep conviction in. So that was Bitcoin, Ethereum, Square, and Tesla. And that did that did really well and gave me the freedom to pursue my entrepreneurial journey rather than you know, needing to work in a particular job right now and and make money to sustain myself it's very cool it's very cool um how uh i guess how sure were you do you see what i'm saying like like how sure were you when you did that like um were you like you know how much doubt did you have in your mind when when you when you 
went and, went and did that? Well, when I started, so I, I kind of, it's kind of a thing where I actually started doing this in 2018 gotcha. and, and kind of wrote out that I'd done all of it by mid 2019. Yeah. So I started with Bitcoin and what I did was um, I didn't invest any money. So basically all of the surplus money that I earned or saved over the course of 2018, I invested in Bitcoin. Gotcha. That was all I did. So I just dollar cost averaged the entire year. And basically my thinking, my just frame, general framework was there's a 50% chance that Bitcoin is going to be a multi-trillion dollar asset. And at the time it was maybe 50 billion yeah. around there. So I said, basically the worst thing that's going to happen is that's going to go to zero and it'll be one year of my life that I right, kind of wasted. Gone. Yeah. But there's a greater than 50% chance I'm going to get a 20x return and basically earn 20 years back. Right. So, and I had really deep conviction in Bitcoin specifically. And I was always really interested in Ethereum, but I didn't, I didn't have the conviction. So um, I, I didn't really invest in Ethereum in 2018. And then in 2019, when I saw all this stuff that was going on in DeFi and basically the Ethereum was at like the same point it had been in 2017 when there weren't all of these applications being built on top. I just, I just said to myself, I'm not quite sure how this accrues value, but right. it's so clear that there's so much like talent and energy in Ethereum that it's worth like, you know, putting a little bit of money into. And, um, you know, in hindsight, it's like, man, maybe I should have just bought Ethereum and not, and not Bitcoin at all. But I think, right. I think they're both, they're both great. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, can you talk about Token Terrier a bit? I think you've, you've hit on it a little bit, but I wanted to kind of just box that for people. Yeah, so once I decided that I was going to start making decentralized crypto index um, portfolios, and I can yeah. talk about how they're decentralized, because de decentralization is just such a, a buzzword now. It's like, what does that even mean? Right. And um, so Token Terrier is is just my company that I, that I made specifically to make crypto indices and what's funny is as i've you know gone deeper into this crypto adventure now i'm like making an llc is just kind of a ridiculous thing that that in in five years the 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 infrastructure that is being built in the crypto ecosystem is going to fully replace that so really it's almost just like a legal wrapper gotcha you know, something for, you know, to have limited liability with, but it's not like the ideal way of, of making a um, software as a service company, which gotcha. is what essentially what most of these crypto networks are. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, so Token Terrier really was, uh, well, and you mentioned best, you mentioned the best portfolio. I, I guess, I guess that's what I was, uh, what, what I, what I was asking about is, um, so that's, that's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Square, and Tesla. Is that right? Yeah. So I think that's the new thing, right? New so thing. early 2010, uh, you know, the, the dumb trade was to just buy Fang, what Facebook, Amazon, I guess you can put one A or two A's, right? Yeah. Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, and that you would have like 10 extra money over yeah. a decade <laughs> or something. And, and I think we're now at the point where best is where Fang was at in like 2011. Very cool. Very cool. So it's not, it's not consensus, but it's also now has like, it's so big and has so much momentum and has attracted so much capital that it's clear to me that all of those are going to succeed in a big way. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. You know, um, what is common knowledge to people in the DeFi community that, you know, lay people would just find surprising? Yeah, I think, so I think the, the biggest one, and we touched on it earlier was that real yields in DeFi, um, they are real and they are way bigger than in, in the traditional world. And, and basically um, there's a number of, of reasons for that. And, and I probably wouldn't be able to tell you all of them, but a lot of it is that these DeFi protocols are just replacing services that are being done by, by banks. So uh, market making is, is gotcha. the, the great example. 
Um, and then, yeah, it's market making and then trading. So gotcha. I guess trading and lending are the two things. And so if you can do that via a DeFi protocol that doesn't have this, you know, doesn't have this huge fixed cost base of all of these branches and all of these right. employees, and it's just being done via smart contracts and individuals interacting with that, right? It, it's way more orders of magnitude more efficient than what is being gotcha. done in, in, in the legacy financial system. And so basically capital is just pouring into the space. I think one of the, my favorite data points is I remember I wrote this article at the beginning of 2020 and in it, I said that 2019 was the year of DeFi, which makes me laugh because it, there was less than, I think at the end of 2019, there was $700 billion, or sorry, $700 million of value locked in DeFi. Now it's almost 300 billion Good Lord. in two years, Jesus. in two years. And, and we haven't even got a lot of these scaling technologies that, yeah. you know, all the the big brain people at Ethereum and Solana and these other protocols are making that are just going to make it orders of magnitude cheaper to conduct right. transactions in crypto than currently. So, so basically, yeah, I, I just see it as like a, um, what's that thing you flip over and the sand goes from one side to the other. Yeah. 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 Um, oh my God. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> yes, I know exactly. Jesus, I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Yes. Well, anyhow, I think that's what's going on right now is is one is is the it's just like a black hole of of value is being sucked out of the legacy financial system because it's it's inefficient and so returns are actually higher in this new system and eventually all the capital will migrate from one side to the other. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um I, I'm curious because you know I looked at I looked at the best portfolio and I wanted to get some you know in advance of this conversation, um, but the transaction fees on Ethereum are just so high. Um, uh, do you see that getting resolved? It, it sounds like you do. You do like you mentioned that earlier, but do, do you see that getting resolved in a robust way? Yes, I I do see it getting resolved in a robust way, but I think the demand this, this is kind of an interesting thing, and I think it's. This is confusing a lot of people in the crypto space is there is so much demand for conducting transactions in the blockchain space regardless of the blockchain yeah that no individual blockchain is scaling fast enough gotcha. to to absorb it so there's this whole concept of induced demand have you heard of this no so so this example is so imagine there's like a really heavily commuted road from like the suburbs into the core of a city where people are are going to in the mornings and evenings to get to work, right? So yeah. the city goes, you know, this is super congested. It takes somebody, you know, five miles away an hour to drive into work. We're going to build more roads. So they build more roads and it actually doesn't uh, reduce the commute time because it just increases, basically it induces more demand for for traveling on the road Got so it. i so it just the new lane immediately fills up as soon as it's built and i think that's exactly what's happening in in with ethereum especially right now but really the entire ecosystem gotcha and i think so, that'll just continue is that s the supply will keep increasing but the demand will increase faster than supply and that'll just continue for years gotcha but it does sound like maybe maybe eventually you can build enough road. Like if it's just like this, like maybe you can scale far enough where, uh, you know, transaction fees start to go down. Yeah, and that's already. I mean, that's already happened. So I think, like you mentioned, you tried. Did you try to buy some best tokens? Yeah, I was going to do it. I was looking into it, and I can't remember, but it was like the. Um, the, the I remember the transaction fees were just. In, it was insane how much it was going to be. Right. So this is. Um, so for anybody maybe who's listening, like a, a, a best token, so this is the Bitcoin, Ethereum, Square, Tesla portfolio that we're talking about. And basically, I just took that name and made um, a portfolio on token sets, which is based on Ethereum. And that allows anybody in the world with an internet connection and an Ethereum wallet to create an Ethereum-based portfolio. So I did that. 
And the problem you ran into and you did it <clears throat> is it cost like a thousand dollars of Ethereum gas fees just to create the portfolio. Yeah. Not even to like buy the assets, right? And that's because the demand for the the block space on the Ethereum chain has is exceeding the total supply, which is essentially capped right now. So what's happening is you're seeing layer twos be built. So like polygons, this great example. So data economy index has the exact same problem, gotcha. right? So it's built on the Ethereum base layer. So if you're, it's called minting. If you're minting the data economy index, which just means um, going and getting the different tokens that are in the index, putting them together to make the index, yeah. then that's going to cost a lot of money. <clears throat> so what we can do is actually mint a lot of those units at once and move them onto an L2 like Polygon. So this is exactly what has happened. And you can actually, with US dollars, go directly to Polygon where the transaction fees are like maybe 10 cents. A, I think 10 cents a transaction would be high. So you could buy potentially up to $1,000 worth of the data economy index on Polygon directly with US dollars at a 10 cent transaction fee. Very cool. And that, that's that's currently currently there. Super cool. So there's, and there's this, yeah, it's, there's this wallet called Dharma wallet, which is for US based users where you can do that. And that was really important to me because a lot of what the web three or crypto revolution about is about to me is making sure that ordinary people. And when I say ordinary people, I mean, people who are not accredited investors or millionaires yeah. have access to the same opportunities as people who do have connections and money. Right. And so to me, it's really important that somebody would be able to buy $20 of the data economy. Definitely, index. Definitely. And with these layer twos, like Polygon, you can do that. Finally, finally, that's an option. That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, you wrote a great piece. What is the purpose of wealth to you? Yeah, to me, right? So I think it's different for everybody, right? Everybody has their yeah. reason for for um, making money or accruing wealth. And for me, that like reason really started when I was 14. So um, I was in history class reading ahead because I don't know if the class was pretty never slow. fast enough yeah. or whatever. It was pretty slow, you know, public school. And I kind of have read to the back half of the book and it was talking about Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller, the, the robber barons is their, yes. their negative connotation name. And I was just amazed because I, my entire life taken the technology that we have around us for granted, right. You know, skyscrapers, cars, airplanes, um, all of these things were invented basically a hundred year span from 1860 to 1960. And I was like, I want to have that kind of an impact on the world. So it just made me really interested in technology and investing. And so kind of my, my philosophy is that the purpose of, of making more money, accruing more wealth is to create miracles. And so there's this great quote from Peter Thiel that I love that's in that blog post, which is basically that humans are distinguished from, are distinguished from all other species on earth by our ability to create miracles and we call miracles technology. And so to me, that's, um, I want to see more miracles in the world, whether that's increasing financial accessibility through, through blockchain or um, making people live longer and help healthier lives through longevity tech or you know, increasing energy and having it be clean with nuclear power, any of these things, I wanna see technology progress on all dimensions as quickly as possible. Um, that's what really, that's what really drives me. I love that. And it, it does seem like it's interesting. You mentioned, you know, Andrew Carnegie and, you know, you know, Duke's right down the road, you know, another one of these yeah. great conglomerates. Right. And, um, you know, endowed all these universities, especially in the South and, uh, you know, Vanderbilt. And I can't help but wonder, you know, like, it's interesting, you know, you work in, in crypto, Web3. Um, this is where it feels like a lot of innovation is happening. 
and it's notable because it seems to be happening because it's it's fairly unregulated and you've kind of been able to, to escape around a lot of the institutions that are blocking a lot of innovation um, from happening in the real world. Do you think that's kind of the case and it's like a true fact about the world is that it's just so much harder nowadays to actually do things in the real world that uh, it's just, you know, it's funneling a lot of innovation towards digital things? Yes, I absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, if if you're a person who follows a lot of like Peter Thiel's work, he talks about this, like the stagnation in atoms that's occurred since the 70s. and basically that all progress has shifted to bits because you can't do anything in the real world. So I, I, I do agree with that. And I think part of a lot of crypto's purpose is to improve governance of human institutions. And so I think that's like this thought I had recently about why have atoms stagnated? I started reading yeah. this book, this book in the past week or two called where's my flying car oh yeah uh, really really good book if you haven't if you haven't read it and kind of a thought that i had while reading it is is basically that technology accelerated so rapidly in that 100 year period 1860 to 1960 i mean yeah. we literally went from not being able to fly to like the wright brothers having an airplane in 1903 you know, very crude thing barely that can there. only go short yeah. distances, barely there to what, 40 years later, we're dropping bombs out of B-52s onto, yeah. onto Germany and literally destroying entire cities with nuclear weapons that, yeah. by the way, also did not exist 50 years prior. And so I think there's kind of the sense that I have is that culturally, society became very fearful that our our tech our ability to produce technology was was accelerating faster than our ability to be responsible with it gotcha and so right that's i think what caused the reaction and the backlash that created all these regulatory institutions that basically just halted outlawed progress and atoms right. and so everything got directed to bits and I think part of what's so amazing and interesting about crypto and, and, and blockchain is it's actually going to improve, improve governance in various ways. And if you can improve human institutions, then you can basically improve responsibility, I guess, with technology. Yeah. And maybe that's like one of the key unlocks to get, get the Adams economy moving again. And maybe you can just kind of bootstrap it and get that get that flywheel going again. I really like that. I really like that framing. Um, are you down for a round of overrated, underrated? Yes, yes, awesome. love it. Awesome. So I'll throw a term out there. You know, uh, tell me whether it's over overrated, underrated, or correctly rated, um, and give me a sentence about why. And um, I've got this theory. I'll tell you this theory. Uh, that I okay. have is if you believe in the efficient market hypothesis, these are probably should all be correctly rated. You know what I'm saying? But but very okay. few people do this, right? So, uh, you know, draw your own conclusions. Is efficient markets hypothesis one of the things? It's not, but maybe it should be. Maybe it should be. First one, vastly <laughs> overrated. Yeah. So the EMH, overrated or underrated? It's, it's, I, it's kind of a weird thing. I think it's both extremely overrated and extremely underrated. Ooh, that's good. So the reason why is is it's a good way to reason about markets, which is which is like what what basically you should be asking the question, what do you know, what piece of information do you have that the market doesn't already have? Or how do you disagree with a, the consensus market opinion in some way? Gotcha. And if and so I think the EMH should be getting you to answer that question. But what, what it, it instead does is it basically cripples people's ability to actually believe in themselves. It, it makes you a non-courageous person. Gotcha. And so, 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 they, so I think they ignore when they see the $20 bill on the sidewalk. They're like, it can't be there. Right. Right. When instead it's more like, hmm, like where would a $20 be? $20 right. bill be or something. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. That, that's really good. That's really good. Um, let's see. Fish. Overrated or underrated? Are you getting this from my blog? Because I have yeah, a wall absolutely. of fish on my blog. Yeah. So yeah. I really like fishing. Um, I think I like fishing more than eating fish. 
Interesting. Nice. So this is an un- unfortunate thing. I really like the <laughs> eating crustaceans more, you know, crabs, yeah. shrimp, clams. Those are my, my favorites. That being said, I really love salmon and I love smoked salmon. So nice. once, once you've learned how to create that, <clears throat> you're doing well. You're doing well. Um, so fish overall, hmm underrated people should like fish more nice and they most people don't appreciate fish very much people in asia might have an appropriate sensibility about fish but americans do not not here and, and do you no. just like do you really enjoy the act of fishing is it is it about being in nature and like the, this like a kind of process or, or what is it yeah it's something i grew up doing with my my family so I, I have an aunt in alaska who has a boat in valdez which is like um this huge fishing area yeah. and so yeah it's just a thing i did with my family which was go salmon nice. and halibut fishing as a kid yeah. and it was it was just a blast and it's kind of my way of getting away from everything and and relaxing yeah. um and maybe part of it is like you know what we're talking over an, the internet right now yeah. so much of my work is through a screen right that it is nice to get away from the screen and just be in the, like, you know, uh, get away uh, from the nature. metaverse and live in the universe. Right. <laughs> I love yeah. that. That's really good. Um, yeah. Overrated or underrated? Amazon. Hmm. I would say probably properly rated now. Gotcha. I think it was really underrated when I was working there. And now it's probably properly rated. I think it'll keep growing a lot over the next decade. Gotcha. Very cool. Well, well, Thomas, where can people find your work? Where should we send them? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter, so at Thomas Hepner, and then the Data Economy Index is at Data Index. You can check out my blog at thomashepner.net. Very cool. Thomas, thank you so much for coming on today. I learned a lot. Thank you for hosting me, Well, It's a fun conversation. Absolutely.